Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. Verse 9. He also told this parable to someone, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all, all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. And I call upon Brother Kam Chung to bring us God's message for today. Very blessed morning to all of you. The parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee is sometimes uh, referred to as the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Publican is an ancient Roman term for tax collector. This parable is included in only one of the four Gospels, only in the book of Luke, chapter 18. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this opportune time to hear and share your words. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing at your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. This is a text in NIV. Just now we read in uh, ESV. And the context of this parable. In chapter 18 of the book of Luke, our Lord Yeshua told us two parables. The parable of the persistent widow and the, followed by today's parable, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. He then continued to teach about what we need to learn from the little children and also the rich ruler. Of these four lessons, three of them involve underdogs, a mistreated widow, a despised tax collector, and then little children. The last lesson offered an exception, where a rich young man made an appearance again as a negative example. As seen in the context mentioned just now, Luke 18 starts with the parable of the persistent widow. And interestingly, this parable ends with a probing question, then followed by today's focus. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The question our Lord Yeshua 
as has stirred the hearts of men over the ages. It is found at the second half of verse 8. He asks, However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This probing question serves as the ending of the parable of the persistent widow, and it also helps to prepare our hearts to learn more deeply from the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. How? Let us look at the introduction of this parable in verse 9. It reads, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. This introduction in verse 9 is in a way answering the probing questions he asked in verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now, 2,000 years after he asked that probing question, will he find faith on earth? Or will he find the earth be filled with people who were confident of their own righteousness? Are we the ones who are confident of our own righteousness? We must seriously ask ourselves, am I the Pharisee? or the tax collector. May this parable help us to have a clearer identity of who we are and lead us to a closer relationship with God. In the Gospels, our Lord Yeshua often warned his hearers about things that draws people away from God. Love of money being one of the dangers. He warned that wealth can keep people from the kingdom of God by tempting them to depend on themselves rather than God. The story of the Pharisee and the tax collector reinforces that message. Not only wealth, but any form of pride or self-dependence tends to lead people away from God. As shown in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, even an effort to become holy may produce the opposite effect if it produces spiritual pride and a feeling of superiority. Human beings have an incurable tendency to feed our own egos, to take credit, to compete. The way of God, said our Lord Yeshua, is just the opposite. Trust God like little ch children. Admit wrong, let go of self-pride, and be God-centered. Many of us have heard or read about this parable, and we already have an idea of who the Pharisee was and who the tax collector was. We as readers of the Bible are willing to accept what the Bible says, mostly because we already have foreknowledge that our Lord Yeshua's teaching are radical and full of insights. Nowadays, people like to use a phrase out of the box to describe unconventional thinking. But Lord Yeshua's teaching is out of the world, but yet reaches to the deepest bottom of human hearts. Therefore, in the days when our Lord Yeshua told his, this parable, it was shocking to the hearers of this parable because the Pharisees are those Seem, seem to be following religious practices rigorously. 
They devoted their lives to following God. They gave away exact tithes, obeyed each minute law in the Old Testament, and sent out missionaries to gain new converts. Almost no sexual sin or violent crime was visible among the Pharisees. Yet our Lord denounced these modern citizens. Why? And even more confusing was, how can a much-hated tax collector who collects taxes on behalf of the Romans, the Romans who are the foreign oppressor of the Israelite nation, how can someone that helped the enemy be better than the model citizens, the Pharisees, who are strict followers of the religious rules? Let us compare the two persons in this parable in detail. It can help us to clear out some of our confusions. This table may look a bit daunting, there's so much things inside, but it is just a comparison. I will go into section by section later. So this is the whole table in this uh, parable, where the main characters are the Pharisee and the tax collector, their social status, their location in the temple, their prayer posture, the prayer content, and then our Lord Yeshua's com conclusion about them, and then the reasons why he said so. So before we compare the Pharisees and the tax collector in detail, we have to be aware that most of us have some background knowledge concerning this parable. So we may already have some negative perception towards the Pharisee and are more sympathetic towards the tax collector. But we need to imagine we are time traveling back 2000 years to the time this parable was told. During those times, the Pharisees were considered as respected people that live a holy life, whereas the tax collectors were outcasts of the society, being hated because of their working under the oppressive foreign Roman Empire. After setting our perception right, we can now compare them. First, the Pharisee. The Pharisee means separated ones, separated ones. They were mostly teachers in the synagogues. Synagogues were like churches in their days where they gathered to worship God. They were religious examples or role models in the eyes of the people and were self-appointed guardian, self-appointed guardians of the law and its proper observance. They considered the interpretations and regulations handed down by tradition to be as authoritative as the scripture. So they look upon their traditions, rules and regulations very, very seriously. The strict adherence of these rules and regulations leave little room for them to examine whether their hearts were right with God. Some of the Pharisees were part of a Jewish governing body called the Sanhedrin, which consists of 71 leaders. So the Pharisees were generally in the upper class and were respected in the Jewish society. Now comes to the tax collector, traditionally known as publicans. These were local men employed by Roman tax contractors to collect taxes for them. Because they worked for Rome and often demanded unreasonable payments, the tax collectors gained a bad reputation and were generally hated and considered as traitors, outcasts, and were described as sinners that could not serve as witnesses or judges. 
and were expelled from the synagogue. In the eyes of the Jewish community, their disgrace extended to their families. Are there any examples of the Pharisees and tax collectors mentioned by name in the Bible? Yes. For tax collector, Mr. Levi, in Luke 5, chapter 27, also known as Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew was named after him. And then Mr. Zacchaeus. This person needs no introduction because last week, Brother Larry has introduced him in detail. In Luke chapter 19, verses 2 and 2 to 10, he described him as the rich tax, rich chief tax collector. That means he's a main contractor. Okay? That told Lord Yeshua, he was willing to give half of his wealth to the poor and compensate four times to those he cheated. These are the tax collectors that were touched by our Lord Yeshua, believed in him, and repented from their former ways and received God's salvation. How about the Pharisees? Were they all bad guys? Very interesting. All the Pharisees mentioned by name were not bad guys at all. Mr. Nicodemus, John chapter 3. He is a true seeker of God's truth. And half of John chapter 3 recorded our Lord Yeshua's one-to-one -one lesson given to Nicodemus. From then on, follows by the all-important John 3.16. Then Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, honored by all the people, in Acts chapter 5, verse 34. Both Nicodemus and Gamaliel were truthful and God fearing. Then, surprisingly, Apostle Paul, who was a student of Gamaliel, admitted in Philippians chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 that he was as to the law a Pharisee. Nicodemus and Apostle Paul had personal encounters with the Lord Yeshua and their lives were transformed ever since. So the Bible is recording this truth a person can be a prideful Pharisee or a sinful tax collector, but Lord Yeshua can transform this person's life. Both tax collector Levi or Matthew and Pharisee Paul were later, were later inspired by God to be among the writers for the Bible's New Testament. So they became the writers of the New Testament. What transformed lives? Nothing is impossible to God. We have spent a fair bit of effort to look into the background information of the two characters in this parable. In summary, to the people of that time, the Pharisee is learned, disciplined, and respected, whereas the tax collector is a hated traitor. Now let us look at the other things that this parable mentioned about them. Next, the, their location in the temple. The Pharisee's location was not mentioned, but considering his social status, he would be at ease with the people of his similar social standing. Usually people of such social status will occupy a more prominent area, somewhere near the main room of religious service. As for the tax collector, it was mentioned that 
he stood at a distance. There may be two reasons why he stood at a distance. Firstly, a tax collector was not welcomed by the mainstream society. Secondly, he considered himself an unworthy sinner. Therefore, subconsciously, he positioned himself at a distance from the holy places in the temple. Maybe he was standing somewhere near the entrance. Next. We look at their prayer posture. Both of them were standing. For the Pharisee, it was likely that his posture was upright, confident, and at ease. Most likely with his head lifted up, with eyes looking to heaven. The tax collector was also standing, but he was hunching his back and not looking up to heaven. He was also beating his breast. We need to find out what caused him to beat his breast. The other occasion where Luke mentioned about people beat their breast is at Luke chapter 23, Verses 48, this was how the people reacted to what happened during the crucifixion. In verse 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Then in verse 48, when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. The people were deeply saddened over the death of our Lord Yeshua. They beat their breasts to express their anguish, grief, and contrition. The tax collector beat his breast because of his deep anguish and contrition over his sins. Beating his breast helped him to relieve a little from the deep anguish that bottled up inside him. Chinese medicine practitioner can understand this because there are a few acupuncture points around the chest that helps to regulate and relieve anguish, stress, and extreme emotions. And gorillas did the same to express their emotions. In the animations, they always show the fist where they beat their breast. No, it's actually a cup pump. A, a cup pump they beat here and they only beat every about 10 hours once not every time okay <laughs> okay so let's move on to the prayer content the content of their prayers the Pharisee thanked God because he is not like robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and this tax collector that is standing at that corner. He also led a disciplined life that followed strictly to all the traditional Jewish laws. He was actually reminding God that he is not a sinner and he didn't break the Ten Commandments. And he followed the good traditional Jewish practices. The tax collector was very honest. He acknowledged that he is a sinner. He has only his broken life to offer to God. And he pleaded to God to have mercy on him. Our Lord Yeshua's conclusion 
was God considered the tax collector to be justified, but not the Pharisee. The reason is simple. God looks at the whole being of a person, especially the heart. Both of them pour out their heart's content. The whole being of the tax collector was one that clearly knew he couldn't help himself. He offered no excuses or long story of why he became a sinner, but he offered himself wholeheartedly to seek God's help to save, to save him, fully trusting that only God can forgive his sins and renew his life. Romans 10.10 10 says, let's read together, Romans 10.10, 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess with your faith and are saved. So, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. Okay? So, the whole being of the tax collector makes one thing clear. He believed that only God can save him. Lord Yeshua acknowledged that and concluded that he is justified. But for the Pharisee, his life was choked with the rules and regulations that were loaded on him since young. His attention was always on how closely he can follow those rules. He didn't give his heart opportunity to reflect on the purpose of the rules. He mistakenly believed that his good life can help him to be justified before God. He wrongly believed that good works can redeem him from man's sinful nature. He was deceived by his sinful nature by taking pride over his exemplary life not realizing his pride over his morally outstanding life is a sin by itself and caused him to become not justified before God. His prayer revealed his heart's content, which is pride and arrogance. And Mark chapter 7 verses 20 to 23 explains to us that the evil content of the heart can defile a person Let's read together what comes out, what defies them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So we can see that the problem concerning the Pharisee was, oh sorry. Arrogance. Okay. Clearly arrogance come out from the Pharisee's heart. Our Lord's cutting comment to a group of Pharisees in a different occasion in Luke 16, it's amazingly fitting for the Pharisee in today's parable. In Luke 16, 15, he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people highly value is detestable in God's sight. So we know that God's way is different from man's way because God does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Our Lord gave us this advice at the end of this parable. For everyone who exhorts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exhorted. Let's read together again. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said almost the same in Luke chapter 14, verses 11. At the end of another parable, but this parable was advising people not to rush for seats of honor at a wedding feast. So in Luke 14, 11, he also said, for all those who exhort themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhorted. He advised people to always remain humble in all areas of lives, even in a wedding dinner. Never worry about not being recognized or appreciated. Even we have, even we have done many good deeds. So sometimes we are very worried of not being recognized or appreciated after we've done many good deeds. But we need to maintain a strong belief that our God sees our hearts and will lift us up in due time. Apostle Peter said the same in 1 Peter verses 5 to 6. Let's read together. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may leave you up in due time. So after going through, so God is not unkind. He remembers us and he will leave you up in due time. So after going through this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, now is reflection time. As are we seeing ourselves in the two characters mentioned? Are we confident in our own righteousness? And are we comparing with others? Or are we at the other end of the spectrum, considering ourselves as unworthy of anything from God? Or are we fluctuating between the Pharisee and the tax collector? Where is our heart leading us? So we can group the questions arise as follows. Firstly, is comparing oneself with others wrong? And then two, considering, is considering oneself as unworthy of anything from God right? What, on, what ought one's theology of the heart be? And four, as we consider our Lord Yeshua's last verse in verse 14, what is that to us? personally. These questions may sound simple, but yet are broad and deep. It can be very, it can be a very personal one and deserves you to spend time in reflecting over them. I will not attempt to answer them on your behalf, but I hope the lessons that we learn from this parable can guide you in finding an edifying answer for yourself. And if you are in a CG, which stands for Cell or Care Group, freely share with your CG members. So what can we learn? There are three very basic lessons from this parable. Firstly, beware of false confidence. The Pharisee was confident that he was living a righteous life. He consistently prayed, fast and tithe. And our Lord Yeshua even used them as a benchmark to guide believers. Surprise, right? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So there are things from the Pharisees worthy for us to learn. What we must not learn from the Pharisees is their tendency to showcase their righteousness before men and move further to even trying to justify themselves before God. They cared about how others perceived them. So they said and did the things that made them appear righteous and holy. 
they look down upon those whose action didn't match up with their beliefs. In this case, the tax collectors, the robbers, evildoers, and adulterers. The Pharisees elevated themselves by comparing, competing, and looking down on others. They keep their righteousness on the outside, forming a hard shell of false confidence in protecting themselves. They are like lobsters, having a hard shell or exoskeleton on the outside, hard, cold, insensitive, even offensive. The exoskeleton protects them and protects their movements, but an exoskeleton limits the growth. And the danger is, if it is broken, inside is helpless, soft, vulnerable tissues that could not withstand any challenges. We may think that we are not those who are confident of our own righteousness and look down on others. But the truth is, most of us can't see the plank in our own eyes. The Pharisees missed the mark in many ways, as many of us today. It is easy to read about the Pharisees and scoff at their hypocritical ways, but we must be willing to take a serious look at ourselves because it is so easy to become overly confident in our own self-righteous ways, just as the Pharisee did. We all have room for improvement in living our lives pleasing to God. May this reminder keep us from being overly confident in our righteousness. Lesson two, this is the other end of the spectrum. Don't overly look down on ourselves. The world is full of challenges and temptations. We admire those that are able to overcome challenges and reject temptations. But as we turn our attention from such capable people to our own selves, to our great disappointment, we are the opposite. We fail to overcome challenges and we fall to temptations. How worthless can we be? We achieve nothing and to make things worse, we sin. The downward spiral sucks us into a mind trap. We start to believe that we are truly worthless and are unworthy to receive anything from God. We look down on ourselves and as time passes, we overly look down on ourselves. And this causes us to stay away from society stay away from church friends, stay away from church activities, stay away from prayers and the intake of God's words. Stop, wake up, stay away from this train of thoughts. Look at Luke chapter 18 again. Isn't it filled with lowly characters like the mistreated widow the despised tax collector, or the disregarded little children. Hasn't our Lord Yeshua turned the worldview upside down and gave loving attention to them all? Our Lord appreciated and considered as justified the humble, heartfelt, and apologetic plea of the tax collector. His simple, Yet genuine contrite prayer exemplifies the sincerity and heartfelt, heartfelt relationship that God wants with all of us. That is not all. What about the tax collectors and Pharisees mentioned by name earlier? Tax collector Levi, 
also known as Matthew and Zacchaeus and Pharisee Paul, who said he was the worst of sinners in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So all of their lives were transformed by the saving grace of our almighty God. And now they become encouraging by biblical characters for us to learn from. So do not overly look down on yourself. There is no one that is too unworthy for our Lord Yeshua to die for. He has died for our sins and rose again. Come back to him and humbly submit your unworthiness to him and he will renew your lives. The third and the last lesson, God wants our hearts. When we make the choice to follow Christ, it is easy to become prideful or self-righteous for the ways we serve him and live our lives. But pride is an evil idol that takes away our hearts and minds down the wrong path and away from God. God loves humble servants who serve him with their hearts. We can't understand our hearts because God said in Jeremiah 79, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So we ourselves cannot understand our own hearts. So it is best to let God to be the Lord over our hearts and let our hearts be filled with God's Holy Spirit and His words. Then God's laws and commandments that seems hard will be like the bones in our body. They are hard and strong and helps us to stand up and move around freely. But on the outside, we can't see them. Can you see your bones? No, right? On the outside, it's soft tissues like the skin, hair, which actually represent God's love. So we have God's laws and commandments as our endoskeleton, the opposite of exoskeleton. Endoskeleton is inside. Exoskeleton is like the lobster, the lobsters is outside. So we know that endoskeleton is also hard and strong, but they are unseen. They allow its strength and hardness to be covered by other soft and flexible tissues like muscles, fats, and skin. These outer tissues is God's love and they compensate what is lacking in the heart bones. They also offer softness, warmth, and the sensitive awareness to the surrounding needs. These outer tissues function as gentle, compassionate, adaptable, and loving mediator to reach out to the world concerning God's good news of salvation. The good deeds done are always not in the spotlight. The spotlight is always on God and his good attributes. This way of living out God's words are putting in practice the Christian saying that we are not saved by good works, but are saved to do good works. I repeat, we are not saved by good works, but are safe to do good works. The transition from exoskeleton to endoskeleton requires a truly humble heart that is fully God-centered. This is from self-exaltation 
to humbleness, from Pharisees to tax collectors. This heart is always at peace. Its comfort, joy, and satisfaction comes from seeing more and more people come to know and believe in God through believing in our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. So the above are the three very basic lessons we can humbly learn. Firstly, don't. What is the first, first lesson? Beware of false confidence. Second lesson, don't overly look down on ourselves. And thirdly, God wants our hearts. Okay? So this is not limited to all. So God, our merciful God may have revealed much more to each of you individually. Feel free to share them with others. So we are back to the probing question asked at the very beginning. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Our Lord Yeshua gave us the answer at the end of his ever precious Sermon on the Mount. He concluded in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the, on the sand or rock. Okay, good. Right. <laughs> this wise man, wise man builds his house on the rock. Okay. So I repeat. Everyone who hears these words and of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. These wise, faithful ones will become part of the faith the Son of Man finds on earth when he comes. Be the faithful ones and put into practice. For everyone who exhausts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Ultimately, it is God's desire that the Pharisees in us humble himself, repented of his self-pride, and let his discipline to help him to be truly submissive to the view of God. And also, the tax collector in us to make it a must to continue to sustain his repentant heart and be obedient to God's law and grow to be a true disciple of our Lord Yeshua. This is the end of the sermon. We commit this time to prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you and glorify your holy name. We thank you for your precious words and lessons. Thank you for, the, for reminding us for everyone who exhausts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Help us to be wise hearers of your words and help us to put your precious words into practice. We ask this and pray this in our Lord Yeshua's most precious and holy name. Amen.